reading through the Bible in one year, May 29th, Deuteronomy 1 through 8 or 1 1 through 18, Psalm 35 through 36, Isaiah 19 16 through 26, and Matthew 5 1 through 30. These are the words that Moses spoke uh, to all Israel. Oh, wait, hold on. I'm a dork. Why am I doing this? We have to read the introduction. Deuteronomy, which means second law, is a retelling, or I call it kind of a synopsis, by Moses of the teachings and events of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. It includes an extended review of the Ten Commandments um, and Moses' farewell address to a new generation of Israelites as they stand ready to take possession of the Promised Land. Um, Moses reminds them of God's faithfulness and love, but also of God's wrath on the previous generation of Israelites because of their rebellion. Repeatedly, he charges Israel to keep the law. Deuteronomy is a solemn call to love and to obey the one true God. There are blessings for faithfulness and curses for faithlessness. So many curses. The book closes with the selection of Joshua's uh, of Joshua as Israel's new leader and the death of Moses. Let's begin. These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness, in the Arabah opposite Suf, between Paran and Tophel, Laban, Hazaroth, and uh, Dizahab. It is eleven days' journey from Horeb by way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. In the fortieth year, on the first day of the eleventh month, Moses spoke to the people of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment to them after he had defeated Sihon, king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth and in, and in Edre. Beyond the Jordan, in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to explain this law, saying, The Lord um, our God said to us in Horeb, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. Turn and take your journey, and go to the hill country of the Amorites, and to all their neighbors in the Arabah, and the hill country, and the low land, and the Negeb, um, by the sea coast, the land of the Canaanites, and Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. See, I have set the land before you. Go in, and take possession of the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them, sorry, to give to them, and to their offspring after them. At that time, I said to you, I am not able to bear you by myself. The Lord, your God, has multiplied you, and behold, you are today as numerous as the stars of heaven. May the Lord, the God of your fathers, make you a thousand times as many as you are and bless you, as he has promised you. How can I bear by myself the weight and burden of you and your strife? Choose for your tribes wise and under, wise, understanding and experienced men, and I will appoint them as heads. And you answered me, the thing that you have spoken is good for us to do. So I took the heads of your tribes, wise and experienced men, and set them as heads over you, commanders of thousands, commanders of hundreds, commanders of fifties, and commanders of tens, and officers throughout your tribes. And I charged your judges at that time. Hear the cases between your brothers, and judge righteously between a man and his brother, or the alien who is with him. Again, alien just meaning um, sojourner, somebody who isn't part of the people of Israel, who's living with them. You shall not be partial in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. You shall not be intimidated by anyone, for the judgment is God's. And the case that is too hard for you, you shall bring it to me, and I will hear it. And I commanded you at that time all the things that you should do. Now we are in Psalm 35 and 36. Great is the Lord. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of, buck of shield and buckler and rise for my help. Draw the spear and javelin against my pursuers. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let them be put to shame and dishonor who seek after my life. Let them be turned back and disappointed who devise evil against me. Let them be like chaff before the wind, with the angel of the Lord driving them away. 
Let their way be dark and slippery, with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. For without cause they hid their net for me, without cause they dug a pit for my life. Let destruction come upon him when he does not know it, and let the net that he hid ensnare him, and let him fall into it, to his destruction. Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exulting in his salvation. All my bones shall say, O Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him, the poor and needy from him who robs him. Malicious witnesses rise up. They ask me of things that I do not know. They repay me evil for good. My soul is bereft. But I, when they were sick, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with head bowed on my chest. I went about as though I grieved for my friend or my brother, as one who laments his mother. I bowed in my mourning. But at my stumbling, they rejoiced and gathered. They gathered together against me. Wretches, whom I did not know, tore at me without ceasing, like profane mockers at a feast. They gnash at me with their teeth. How long, O Lord, will you look on? Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the lions. I will thank you in the great congregation, in the mighty throng I will praise you. Let not those rejoice over me who are wrongfully my foes, and let not those who wink the eye, who hate me without cause. For they do not speak peace, but against those who are quiet in the land, they devise words of deceit. They open wide their mouths against me. They say, Aha! Aha! Our eyes have seen it! You have seen, O Lord. Be not silent. O Lord, be not far from me. Awake and rouse yourself for my vindication, for my cause. My God and my Lord, vindicate me, O Lord my God, according to your righteousness. And let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, Aha! Our hearts desire! Let them not say, We have swallowed him up. Let them be put to shame and disappointed altogether, who rejoice at my calamity. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor, who magnify themselves against me. Let those who delight in my righteousness shout for joy and be glad and say forevermore, Great is the Lord, who delights in the welfare of her servant, Then my tongue shall tell of your righteousness, and I shall praise you all the day long. Psalm 36. Precious is your steadfast love. Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes, for he flatters himself in his own eyes that his iniquity cannot be found and hated. The words of his mouth are trouble and deceit. He has ceased to act wisely to do good. He plots trouble while on his bed and sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not reject evil. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. O continue your steadfast love to those who know you, and your righteousness to the upright of heart. Let not the foot of arrogance come down, sorry, come upon me, nor let the hand of the wicked drive me away. There, the evildoers lie fallen. They are thrust down, unable to rise. Now Isaiah 19, 16 through 26. Egypt, Assyria, and Israel blessed. In that day, the Egyptians will be like women and tremble with fear before the hand of the Lord, sorry, the hand that the Lord of hosts shakes over them. And the land of Judah will become a terror to the Egyptians. Everyone to whom it is mentioned will fear because of the purpose um, that the Lord of hosts has purposed against them. In that day, there will be five cities in the land of Egypt that speak the language of Canaan and swear allegiance to the Lord of hosts. One of these will be called the city of destruction. In that day, 
there will be five, uh, sorry, in that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord at its border. It will be a sign and a witness of the Lord, sorry, to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt when they cry to the Lord because of the oppressors. He will send them a savior and a defender and deliver them. And the Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians. And the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day and worship and sacrifice with, sorry, with sacrifice and offering. And they will make vows to the Lord and perform them. And the Lord will strike Egypt, striking and healing. And they will return to the Lord and he will listen to their pleas for mercy and heal them. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and Assyria will come into Egypt, and Egypt into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. In that day, Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance." In the year that the commander-in-chief, who was sent by Sargon, the king of Assyria, came to Ashdod and fought against it and captured it, at that time the Lord spoke by Isaiah the son of Amos, saying, Go, and loose the sackcloth from your waist, and shake off your sandals from your feet. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. And the Lord said, As my servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot for three years as a sign and a portent against Egypt and Cush, So shall the kings of Assyria lead away the Egyptian captives and the Cushite exiles, both the young and the old, naked and barefoot, with buttocks uncovered, the nakedness of Egypt. Then they shall be dismayed and ashamed because of Cush, their hope, and of Egypt, their boast. And the inhabitants of this coastland will say in that day, Behold, this is what has happened to those in whom we had hoped and to whom we fled to be delivered from the king of Assyria. And we, how shall we escape? Now Matthew 5, 1 through uh, 30. Okay, so this is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, We're going to go through this for the next couple days. Um, Sermon on the Mount is from uh, Matthew 5 all the way through the end of Matthew 7. Um, a couple things to note here. Um, this is Jesus really starting his ministry. He's done a few things. He's um, become well known for healing people and for healing um, not only a lot of diseases, but for knowing a lot about the Bible. Uh, and everybody's looking to him in expectation that he might be the Messiah, the one that was promised all the way back in the Proto Evangelion in Genesis 3. All right, so he's the one that their eyes are kind of turning to. But there's a problem. See, they think that um, their new, the, the, sorry, the Messiah, when he comes, he's going to be conquering ruler, right? He's going to be there for the sole purpose of crushing Rome and making them rule over the Romans and anybody who's oppressed them before. Um, it's a lot of this um, Christus Victor kind of mentality where they are living in... Um, in in poverty and things aren't going well for them. So God's going to come and put them up as rulers over the people. They're going to be getting a lot of material wealth and they're going to be getting a lot of um, uh, respect from nations, that kind of thing. But we know who've read the Bible, that's not at all what he's doing. In fact, he's coming to uh, kind of change their views of what they think things are. So we're going to see some of that here in the Beatitudes because he's saying uh, things that are very different than what they expect. Then, as we get through um, verse 13 through 16, um, he kind of warms them up a little bit. Again, he's talking to his disciples. There are other people there, but he's talking largely to his disciples. Um, He's letting them know that they are the light of the world. They are the beacons that he's going to fill with the Holy Spirit so everyone will look to them and know that they represent God. Then he starts to get a little scary. Because in 17 through 20, he then 
gives them a little warning saying just just before we get into this next part understand i did not come to abolish the law of the prophets it's going to sound like that because you've been told a lot of things up until now those things aren't true so let me as god explain them in more detail to you right that's exactly what he's doing he's saying you've heard all of these things said before now I'm going to come down and explain it to you and how it really is. You think that it was just the, the, the Ten Commandments, right? That the law itself was just a simple list of rules that you can do your best to keep. And gosh darn it, if you didn't just do your best, well then that's fine. Because you just tried. No. And as we learn at the end of chapter 5, which we're not going to get to today, God has one command. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That's how close you have to get to keeping his law. You have to be perfect at it. No other way around it. So let's begin. So seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Now remember, he's talking to his disciples, right? Here's Jesus as the speaker, talking to whom? The crowd at the Sermon on the Mount, largely his disciples. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed, which also means, oh, how happy, right, are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Like, what do you mean, poor in spirit? Let's read the note. Every human being, except Jesus, is spiritually destitute in God's sight. Remember, they thought that they were the good people, right? They were born of the lineage of Abraham. They were his genetic descendants, and he was blessed by God, and he said, uh, sorry, and God said he's going to bless his offspring. So therefore, he must be blessing all of the offspring, except for those of Ishmael, which we don't talk about, right? And that's simply not the case, because what happened to Esau, right? Jacob I loved, and Esau I what? Hated. But he was a genetic descendant of Abraham, just like Ishmael was. So if you remember when we were going through that in, in Genesis, we were learning about how God, through his sovereign ability, his sovereign rule, he could choose those to whom he was going to grant his inheritance. And he chose Isaac instead of Ishmael. And he chose Jacob instead of Esau. According to the rule of the land, according to the laws of the land, it would have gone to the firstborn, which would have been Ishmael. But God said, nope, your ways are not my ways. And then to Jacob, sorry, to Ishmael, not Ishmael, then to Isaac, <laughs> we're going to, words here, um, were born two children, right? But the older shall serve the younger. Therefore, Esau ended up serving Jacob, who was later named Israel. Right? So why do these people who are descendants of Jacob think that, oh, well, God stopped there and he didn't, he's not specifically choosing his people after that? Does that make sense to you that God would do that? All right, let's go on. So blessed are the poor in spirit which we're reading about here, um, these are people who mourn over their own sin. That's what it means. How can you tell somebody who's a true Israelite? They mourn over their sin. They recognize their sin before God. And as we read before in um, 1 John, right? They understand their sin before God and they mourn over it. They are broken. Do they still sin? Yes. Why? Because we're fallen creatures. And we will continue to sin on this side of the veil of death. But when we sin, we repent, we turn to God, and we ask him to forgive us. We thank him for saving us from our sins. And we ask him that he would please lead, it, please lead us away from temptation so we do not do it again. Because we don't want to besmir besmirch his name. Those are the ones who we're talking about here. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
right? He's saying it's not to everybody. It's to those who are poor in spirit. But as follows with um, uh, standard um, kind of Hebrew literature, you don't just say something once. You say it once, and then you twist it a little bit, and you say it in a different way to back up what you're saying. Then you do that again, and you do it again to really solidify what it is you're talking about. So Jesus continues, Blessed are those who mourn. Mourn over what? They mourn over sin and evil, the things that are happening in the world around them. They mourn over these things because they understand that this is something that comes from the curse, right? And they mourn over the people um, who were born in the image of God, the Imago Dei. And they worry about them and the fact that these people are struggling with these sins, but they don't understand that they're in these sins. They don't understand what the curse is, and they continue to follow along. And they are hurt by it, and they hurt others by it. But they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, right? What does the world tell you? The world says, go out and get yours, right? Someone did something rude to you. Somebody stole something from you. You go back and you get that back. You take them to court. You ruin their life because they ruined yours. But what does God say? Blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Again, restating the poor in the spirit and then the uh, persecuted for righteousness sake. These are bookends that say these are the people who are in God. It's not like naming different groups of people and, oh, well, you're merciful, so you should receive mercy, but I'm a peacemaker because I'm a son of God. No. If you are in Christ, you are poor in spirit over your own sin. You do mourn over the sin of the world. You are meek in that you understand you have authority to do things, but you choose not to do those. You hunger and thirst for what? For your own well-being, for your own greatness, for your own anything? No for righteousness. You are merciful. You are pure in heart. You are a peacemaker. What's our reward for this? Persecution. Jesus tells us that the world will hate us if we represent him correctly. So blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you. Again, blessed meaning, oh, how happy. Oh, how happy are you when you are reviled, persecuted, and people utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on Jesus' account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. See how that works? Remember, they were expecting the Messiah to come and lift them up, put them on the pinnacle and say, these are the greatest people in the world. Everyone should bow down and worship them because they are genetic descendants of a guy I talked to in the desert. No. He shuts that down. So that's his warm up, right? That's him getting them started on thinking the way that he's thinking. The same way you should read the Bible. You shouldn't read the Bible thinking, you know, well, I have these preconceived notions about how things should be. And this is the way that I believe that things are in the world. So I'm going to read the Bible and I'm going to um, read my thoughts into the Bible. So when God says, um, you know, that, that, uh, say, homosexuality is an abomination, right? Um, Well, That was in that day, and that was just what God needed to say at that time. But nowadays, God would love the gay people and love everybody who's against what he, um, who is against what he believes. And it was four things, sorry, not four things, and it is against all the things that he stands for because they're so nice. 
No. You need to read the Bible for what the Bible says. You need to know who God is on his terms, not your terms. So that's what he's doing. He opens up with letting them know, if you want to be someone who is holy and righteous and pure in my sight, you will be rejected by the world, you will be persecuted, and many of you will be put to death. That's what it means to serve me. So then he expands. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Remember how I said that you stayed it in one way and then you twist it a little bit and say it in a different way? Here he does it again. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to the whole house. In the same way, let your light so shine before men, before others, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. What is our purpose? To reflect God's glory back to him. So that people see in us something different, something strange, something holy, something separate, something totally different from the rest of the world. We aren't out there pursuing our own ends. We aren't out there pursuing our own desires or things that we want for ourselves. We're pursuing the righteousness of God in everything that we do. We are making decisions not based on what would benefit us the most, but what would most benefit God and his kingdom. That makes us peculiar. But it gives glory to the God who saved us despite ourselves. So here's his warning. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. It's like, well, why would we think that before? Because what he's about to say is going to sound like he's doing exactly that. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The thing that he's about to say is so different and twisted from what they've been told that they're going to think that he's talking about a brand new law, something that's totally different than what they had seen before. But that's not the case at all. Not at all. What he's doing instead is he's telling them truly what the words have to say. Let's go on. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, it's not iota, it's iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Again, remember, he's speaking from authority. This is something that they weren't used to. The scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers they had in the land and the priests, they would always say, well, Rabbi so-and-so said this, or, um, you know, in, in Scripture we read this. Jesus is talking directly. He's saying, no, this is how it is. I am telling you the way it really is. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. For the common worshiper, that was impossible. They had a job to do. They had other things. The, the, scribes, yeah, the scribes and the Pharisees spent all their time reading the word and memorizing it, and pouring over it, and trying to live their lives perfectly according to what it says. Remember the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law, as we read in Romans, is not to save. It's it's a signpost that points us to Christ, that points us to the promised deliverer way back in that Proto-Evangelion. That's why we have it, to point to him, to tell us, We are going to be delivered by God, 
because we cannot keep his law. Now, what these scribes and Pharisees have been doing is exactly what he says. They've been relaxing them. They've been shaving off the hard edges. They've been telling people, okay, yeah, look, I know that it sounds impossible to do these things, but if you just do X, Y, and Z, and then if you come and like when you can't quite do something, if you sacrifice an animal or two, right, don't worry about it. We'll make up for it for you on the end. That's not what Jesus just said. Like I said, at the end of this chapter, he makes it clear. You need to be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. That's the way you get to heaven. So that was his warning, letting them know ahead of time, we're going to get into some really deep stuff here. So he begins. All right. So you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Well, that's Ten Commandments, right? But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment, or whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, Raka, or you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. See, they had been told that it's just you shouldn't murder somebody, Right? It's it's not just do not kill, it's do not murder. So like, well, yeah, I may have killed someone in war, but I, I've never actually gone and just murdered a guy, right? So I'm perfectly fine. But what is he saying here? He says, no, 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 no. It has nothing to do with actually murdering somebody. It has to do with the intentionality of your heart. If you are angry without cause against somebody, against a fellow um, image bearer of God, then for you, it is as if you have actually murdered that person. That's how God sees it. He doesn't see it just as, um, you know, well, if, if you, you know, literally are there and you strangle the life out of somebody or you stab them to death, then you're guilty of murder. No. Because that other person is also an image bearer of God, just like you are, if you are angry at them without cause, without righteous cause, then it's as if you have murdered them. Verse 23. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, stop. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled with your brother And then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. That's the first thing. Okay. A little scary. I'll have to be more careful about the things that I think, right? I I certainly won't be angry anymore without reason. Oh, okay. Whew. Glad that's done. Okay, Jesus, let's go talk about something else. Nope. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Well, that's easy. I haven't cheated on my wife, right? Easy peasy. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent, looks at a woman with lustful intent, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Past tense, it's already been done. You think that you're clear on this adultery charge? No. Because it's about the intentionality of the heart. So when you look at porn, right? Or when you see some girl walking by who's wearing some sort of short skirt or something, and you look at her, you're like, yeah, that'd be nice. You just committed adultery. You didn't even know. You didn't even have to go up and even talk to her. And you've already committed adultery. This is two out of the Ten Commandments that you've already knocked down. Right? What does James say? He says if you violate one of them, you violated all of them. So what can you do? If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better if sorry, it is better that you lose one of your members than your uh, than that your whole body be thrown into hell. Remember how we said this before, say it one way and then twist it and say it again. 
If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. What he's saying is you need to be radical about this. You need to look at this and understand clearly that God is not playing around. He cares about the intentionality of your heart. He cares about your thought life. That's not your own private playground where you can just think and dream of whatever you want. God owns it all, and you are accountable for all of it. Let's roll back a little bit. Remember how I set up here, or how he set up here? Do not think I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. What he's teaching them is more truth than they have had in hundreds of years of priests and scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees and all these people. He's explaining to them the truth of what it really says. And that's what they're running into. That's why they're getting terrified. We read in, um, I don't remember if it's Ezra or Nehemiah. I think it's Nehemiah. Um, as they're rebuilding the temple after uh, they've been released back from Babylon and they're back rebuilding Jerusalem uh, in the temple and putting up the wall. Um, and they said, sorry, they found the the book of the law and they read it and they fell down on their faces and they were terrified because they realized that for 400 years they had lived against what God had said day after day after day, king after king, um, reign after reign. They had continually gone back to worshiping idols, to violating God's commands, to treating it loosely, to not even caring what God had to say. And they were terrified. And for good reason. But here we are again. Hundreds of years later, after 400 years of silence, Jesus shows up. And he's like, no. You think you understand this, but you're wrong. And we're going to go into more of that tomorrow. But that is exactly where we are. They are now finally understanding for the first time what it is that God meant when he told them these things. Way back on Mount Sinai. Remember what they said before when we were reading through that? It was early on in Exodus, and they said, um, and Moses came down with the Ten Commandments the second time, and he gave them the law, and they said, yes, absolutely, we will do all of that. It was like, hold on here. There's some fine points you need to, nope, nope, whatever it is, we're going to do it. And every adult over 20 died in the wilderness for failing to do it. Why? Because they were looking at the law, not at the God. They were not looking to be delivered. They were looking to fulfill it on their own. And tomorrow, we're going to get more of this. Behold the word of the Lord.